Hello. So today I want to talk all about oscillations, and this is a beginning to the oscillations series that I'm going to do now. Uh, first of all, let's just talk about what is an oscillation, or where, how can we classify an object that is oscillating. To put the most basic example ever, I've made this pendulum, and this is basically a, a metal ball on a string, and let's say there's like a ceiling here and it's kind of tied to this. And if you initially put it, the pendulum is obviously going to hang here, like it's probably going to be like this. If I take my hand, I pull this to the side, and I let go of it, it's going to um, move here and here and here and here. And it's going to oscillate back and forth, and that's what we call an oscillation. So an object oscillates when it moves back and forth repeatedly on either side of an equilibrium position. This equilibrium position is what I've put here. The, the place that I, it would otherwise be before I displaced it, that is the equilibrium position. So that's all it takes for something to be oscillating. There are two types of oscillations and they're very important and they're even more important when you consider things that come later, like resonance. So first of all, we have free oscillations. Free oscillations is a bit like what I did with the pendulum right here. It's, they oscillate at their natural frequency. This means what they would actually like oscillate at if they were just like let to be naturally. Um, this you know obviously depends on maybe like the mass. For example, if this was heavier, then it would oscillate differently, or the the, the shape of it. For example, if the string was shorter or longer, it would also oscillate at a different frequency. So the free oscillation is basically just something that continues happening after initial disturbance, you don't need to keep applying a force to keep something in free oscillation. And it's going to do so at its natural frequency. Um, yeah, that's about it. And then for forced oscillations, on the other hand, it's not at the natural frequency. Uh, what this means is that the vibrations of another body are transmitted to the body. For example, uh, we can talk about, for example, um, you could hold a stick and you could wave it upside down um, and up and down and up and down. And you can keep doing this on other, like either side of one central position. You can take a stick and you, maybe this is like the middle, you decided that that line is the middle part. You can swing it up, you can swing it down, you can swing it up and down. And that is basically also one oscillation according to our definition right here. Um, however, it's not a free oscillation because it's not oscillating at the natural frequency of the branch. The branch wouldn't oscillate like this by itself. And it's it's not after the initial disturbance. We're still holding our hand and we are still forcing it to oscillate. So the, the oscillations or the vibrations of my hand right now is being transmitted to this branch so that it oscillates up and down. And that's what forced oscillations are. Uh, you could also do this, for example, with a ruler. Uh, if you... If you substituted this branch for a ruler, and then you oscillate it up and down, then it would be a forced oscillation. However, you could also have, let's say this is your table, you could put the ruler like this. That's your ruler. And you could flick it down, you could pull it down, and let it go. And it would probably, if you have a springy enough ruler, it's going to go up and down and up and down. That is the natural frequency of the ruler. It does it by itself after an initial disturbance, which was your finger. That's a free oscillation. So I've just shown you how to use the exact same object, which is the ruler, to get both a free oscillation and a forced oscillation. So some other facts about oscillations. We can observe frequencies of os oscillations that are smaller than 5 hertz. This means that they have 5 oscillations per second. As long as it is having 5 oscillations per second, we can observe it. If it goes even faster than that, we will probably only look at it as a, as a sort of blur. So if you want to actually observe something that is like oscillating at a frequency that is higher than os like 5 hertz, then we can use a stroboscope. And what a stroboscope is, is it's something that just, it's a light, it's a lamp that flashes on and off really fast. You can actually control at what rate you want it to flash. So for example, let's say we had um, some ball. Oh, sorry. This is the ball. And it's going up and it's going down. And if, let's say this was going up 
at 6 hertz. Um, we could have a stroboscope, and this is just a lamp, and it's showing us this. It's just a flashing lamp. We could maybe put this at um, 5.8 hertz. So we have put this not exactly the same as this, but very, very similar. So what this happens is when in the 6 hertz, it moves up and down and it goes back, this will blink at a bit of a slower rate, which means that it's going to blink when this has already finished one oscillation and has gone a bit ahead. That's when it, the light is going to go out and on again. And it's going to keep going on this way. It, it's going to go on again when it's a little bit above it because this is going faster than this, a little bit more above it. So what we're seeing essentially as the lights flick on, when we the lights flick on, we can only see that it has moved slowly, a bit up and a bit up. And that's not because the ball is actually moving that slow. It's because when it's already gone one time and gone a little bit more upwards, that's when the light flashes on and that's when we can see it. And then it goes dark. And in that moment, this will go another route and come back to a little bit of a higher position and the light will flash on. And then we can see how far it has gone. It's going to look like it is going on in slow motion because we can only see when the light is flashing on. So that's how a stroboscope works. You adjust it so that the frequency of it is really similar but not the same with the frequency of the oscillating object. If you made it a, a bit higher, let's say 6.2 hertz, then you would obviously see it going in the opposite direction. Um, because this is actually moving slower than this is flashing, so it wouldn't be done with its with its oscillation yet. And so when it's here, uh, you'll probably make the light flash on, stuff like that. So you could use a stroboscope, but the main point is that it has to be slower than 5 hertz for us to be able to observe it. Uh, now we can go and study the motion of an oscillation. And I have my pendulum right here, which again is very, very handy for oscillations. Uh, this is the equilibrium position. It's obviously not perfect, but that's the equilibrium position. Imagine you displacing it to one side and then letting it go so that it goes back and then it slows down a bit and then it will go back. It's like one of those like hypnotic things. I'm not really sure what I think. I don't know, but yeah. Or in the grandfather clock, there is that little clock thing that always oscillates here and there. It's that exact motion, and if we were to, were to split it up into different parts and to describe it, um, let's first start with position number one. This is position number one. This is when the object from this displaced position is let go. What would you expect to happen? It would obviously accelerate towards the center. Now, in the specific case of the pendulum, this is because it has a force that is weight. So this is weight, and you can split this, you can resolve this into weight here, which is basically offset by the tension, and it, you can also resolve it into this thing, which is going directly to the equilibrium position, right? Because of this force, when there is a force, F equals MA, and therefore there is an acceleration. So the ob object will accelerate towards the center. However, at the center, weight is going exactly down, offset by tension, there's no force, there's no component on either side. There is zero acceleration on the middle position. So it travels with the highest speed at the center because up till this point, it's been accelerating. And then once you pass this point, your weight's going to be like this. It's going to be offset by the tension. And the other component is going to be going to this side, which means you're going to have an acceleration to this side. So if you're moving this in this direction you're going to basically be decelerating so after you pass this point it's going to decelerate as it moves towards the end of the oscillation and if you reach this end of the oscillation you're going to be at the extreme position and it will stop for a moment very very instantaneously it would reverse its motion and then it would accelerate back towards the center so it would accelerate this way because the force is here so it is this constant cycle of acceleration, highest speed, and zero acceleration, deceleration, stopping the motion, and then acceleration again. It's this constant motion. It's not the same speed at all sides. It is constantly 
changing. Here's how we can describe an oscillation. So I've just taught you about that, which means that we can basically graph it on. And if you graph on something, some oscillation like the one that I just showed you, we would get something like this. So we conventionally like to put the right side direction. So for example, if we had this one right here, this we like to put as the positive direction. This we like to put as the negative direction. And why this is helpful is because when we look at this, it shows us that um, the displacement, so it's traveling up, upwards first, which means that it is going to the right side of the positive, and then it is going to negative. Um, this is called a sinusoidal motion because you can clearly see that the displacement time graph is in the shape of a sine curve. And we can definitely relate this to every single motion of the um, pendulum, like this and like that. For example, if the motion started with the pendulum over here, it would move here, right? And it would quickly be decelerating. When it's at its maximum position, that's going to be here. It is the biggest displacement from the equilibrium position. Then it's going to go back. It's going to go back. And at this zero right here, it's going to be exactly at its equilibrium position. And then it's going to go to the other side, to the left side, where we see the negative displacement, and so on and so forth. So basically, the displacement is a measurement, perpendicular measurement, by the way, uh, between the position and the initial equilibrium position. So the maximum uh, displacement is this peak, right? And this is what we call the amplitude in a sinusoidal graph, just like the ones that we did in the waves. Um, yeah, that's about it. And we call this maximum displacement. It is denoted by this X O. And period T is basically, you could see that this is one full cycle, just like going back to its original position. And that's the time for one complete oscillation. The frequency is obviously the number of oscillations per second. So over here, we have exactly two oscillations. See that? We have exactly two oscillations. One, two. And let's say that, you know, this took like one second, right? Let's say at here, that was one second. Then within one second, two full oscillations. So this would actually be two hertz. And as we have learned before, the period time t and the frequency, they are the reciprocals of each other, which makes a lot of sense. So then we go on to something called the phase. So the phase is basically the point that an oscillating point has, uh, oscillating object, sorry. The point that an oscillating object has reached within the complete cycle of an oscillation. So is it here? Is it here? Because oscillations are repetitive this is the same with this it's the same point that it has reached within its oscillation so for example bringing up the pendulum again if it was exactly at this point and it was traveling in this direction you would reach it once during one oscillation however you could reach it again during the next oscillation although the time is different it is much the same exact position and point that's what we say is the phase so the phase difference is basically the difference between two oscillations and how much they differ in their pace of oscillations. Like how far are they and what is the difference between how far they are. For example, let's bring up our pendulum once again. And let's say at t equals one second, this guy is at its exact position of equilibrium. This guy, oh, let's not do that. Let's do, this guy is at this position. However, he is at the maximum displacement. So they have a difference, but we're gonna assume, and when you want to calculate phase difference, you can only calculate it when everything else is the same, when their, um, per their period, their frequency, their amplitude, that is all the same. Let's say these are the exact same pendulum that have been uh, displace the exact same amount, that's the only time when phase difference will actually be able to be calculated. So if we talk about that, 
the graph of this at t equals 1 seconds, let's say t is 1, is over here, this is going to be at the zero position, which means that it's going to be maybe like this. Uh, oh, no, wait, hold on. It's going to be like this, actually. Why is it going to be like this? It's because it's going from a negative displacement. Remember that the left side is negative and the right side is positive. It's going to be going from a negative displacement to a positive displacement, and it makes this switch during t equals 1. Um, however, at t equals 1, this guy has its maximum negative displacement, which means this is happening like that. So that's the difference between these graphs. And, and if we extend the graphs like this, like a sinusoidal graph, and if we extend this one as well, we can see that they're actually the same. They're just a little bit behind. So we can calculate, um, and we can see that they're actually a quarter. So this is, this is obviously, um, I'm not sure if you can see, but this is a quarter. This is one full cycle, right? And they are... The, a quarter of that cycle difference with each other, which means that their phase difference is one-fourth of an oscillation. It's the interval time t between two um, corresponding points. So the same points, these two are the same points, right? And it's divided by the period t. Um, you could use it as a fraction of an oscillation like how I have done here, or you can also represent it in degrees or in radians. For example, one-fourth, and let's say the one full cycle was carried out in 360 degrees, it could also be a 90 degrees phase difference, or it could be a 1 out of 2 pi phase difference, where this would be radians. So yeah, uh, just to for the last part, um, really depict what's happening here, let me draw again that very messy graph I drew. So let's say we have this one here, and then we have like this one here. Um, we're trying to see, because these two are obviously the exact same points. So they're corresponding points. We're trying to see the difference here divided by the total time taken for one oscillation. That would be this. How much is the time taken on this one? Let's say this was 2 seconds, and let's say the difference between this was 0 0.5 seconds, and the phase difference would be 0 0.5 divided by 2 equals 1 out of 4. So that is basically how phase difference is calculated. And that's about it for the beginning to oscillations. On the next video, I'm going to talk about simple harmonic motion, which is a much longer topic, I think. Um, thank you for watching.